thank you everyone here today. Um, how crypto derivatives are changing Wall Street as we know it. And just to step back, you know, what is that story? Uh, that story is really the question, is the emergence of crypto spurring a transformation of any kind in the existing financial system? Um, the, the big story of disruption. And I think you can definitely make an argument that crypto derivatives are, are right in kind of the ground zero of that story, um, sort of the nexus between traditional finance and crypto. So let's get started. I know a lot of the questions are going to be, you know, sort of how crypto has evolved its own market conventions and maybe how that's influencing uh, the commodities industry, the, 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 um, uh, derivatives ex the regulated derivatives exchanges. So first question, just to kind of get us started here, you know, uh, I was talking with you about this, Tim. You look at some of these charts, you know, the candle charts of, of you know, trading and crypto is 24 seven, right? So you have these continuous, beautiful candles you know, whereas you look at futures trading and, you know, or traditional markets and you have all these gaps in the charts. So is, that a, is that something we could see? Is, is a, the traditional financial system being pushed by crypto more towards a 24-7 world? Yeah, I think it's a great question, right? And, you know, everyone loves to hate the CME gap, right, I think, in, in crypto. But I think what's interesting about that is what people are actually doing and, and maybe not realizing, you're having a very technical observation about futures market structure and following whether or not gaps are being closed or opening further. Um, and I think when we take our lead from the end users, it is clear that crypto is a 24 by 7 market. Um, but there are still some limitations we're trying to work through in the, the centralized exchange space and centralized clearing uh, to close that gap to, to go in 24-7. So there's certainly a need. Uh, we're working to, to try and get there. Um, so kind of stay tuned on that front. But I think when we look at the, the need is the related or the interrelatedness between the cash market and the derivatives market is a, a tried and tested relationship that exists in other asset classes. And it's certainly evolving in crypto and increasing in velocity is the term that I use for that interrelatedness and that price, uh, the price formation and the risk transfer. So it's not lost in us that if we really want to make that efficiency even greater, they need to trade at the same time 24-7. Matt, what do you think about this question? So we <clears throat> operate both a, a spot and a futures market. And our spot market is 24 by 7, futures 24 by 5. I think there's an interesting angle here, though, which is that the spot market, the asset is a global asset. So it's not a feature or, or a creation within a specific regulatory context where, let's say, futures that trade on a CFTC-regulated exchange really are a US-centric product. So when you look at traditional assets and, and you ask yourself, well, why don't a lot of these assets trade 24 by 7? There may not be liquidity during those off hours. So while information can't get incorporated into the market during those periods, there also, at the same time, may not be demand to trade during those periods, in which case you may have even choppier markets. So you know, just to take an example, the US equities markets, 930 to 4, there's a pre and a post. But trading in those periods is often at prices that may not be contiguous with the prices that you saw during the primary session. So, it's not clear yet. Certainly, venues have the capability to do those two things and offer both 24 by 7. So I think we'll have to see whether there's demand for that with US futures products. And what do you think, Rich, as the investor, the user? What are your thoughts on this? I certainly think it's coming. If you, if you look at uh, what's had the biggest impact on markets over the past uh, decade or two, it's really you know, technology. So as opposed to it being that crypto is having this impact, I think that without as many legacy you know, issues, crypto has been able to be more tech forward. And I think that over time, that, that pull is going to very much impact uh, traditional finance as well. Um, just to, to turn to the next question here, one thing that, that I find super fascinating about crypto markets, you have this technology, people are betting on this technology, you contrast it with the dot-com era where people were using the stock market to bet on you know, e-commerce and the web, and now you have crypto markets being used to bet on crypto, right? And, and, and you, Tim, you were talking earlier about, you know, um, re at a sponsor panel, reference rates that you've published on, like, Polkadot, Cosmos, Algorand, you know, but you have to wait for approval for the CME. Meanwhile, crypto just does it, right? Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, certainly. So it's a great question. So 
as a regulated U.S. designated contract market futures exchange and derivatives clearing organization, we need certain regulatory clarity before we introduce tradable products, so futures, options on futures, and that's largely why that development is being constrained to Bitcoin and Ether, because that's where we have said clarity. But when we look on the reference rate side, uh, that is something that they're also regulated benchmarks, but it's under the, the BMR regime out of the EU. But there's much, many more degrees of freedom in terms of what we can do and what we can offer to the marketplace. And what's interesting, it's the same customer demand function that we were hearing circa 2015 with respect to Bitcoin. As, as this ecosystem is continuing to grow, the market wants a more trusted and transparent indication of what the US dollar or euro value of that asset is at a given time or on a real-time basis. And we can provide that service in these other kind of additional 12 or so reference rates and real-time indices that we introduced. Now, our focus, though, is that we are going to have to marry our ability to do that with where do we think longer term demand is coming from the marketplace. And that's why we focused on that, those handful, because it represents about 90 percent of the tradable coins and tokens that are out there. And we also are focusing on those that serve fundamental utility is the expression we use that either as a function of their projects. We see a risk management need for these names down the road, but we're not necessarily looking at some of the, the meme coins or even stable coins, because that's, that's a little bit different than our overall ethos around that we've demonstrated for eventual product development that we've done with Bitcoin and Ether in a regulated fashion. Rich, what do you think? Are, people, are investors gonna wait for CME's Solana futures? I think that uh, you know, there's, there's different needs that are serviced by, by um, different parties, and, you obviously, you're gonna, gonna trust CME's word on the, where uh, Bitcoin is, and if it's a, a big trade between a, you know, a miner and a bank, that's gonna be a, a good third-party source. But there's other times where someone just doesn't know where the price is for a certain instrument, and even if it doesn't have uh, the same type of uh, regulatory scrutiny over it, um, if you're able to, to produce that type of data, it can be very important. Interesting. Um, just m moving on. Uh, you know, obviously the, the, the basic, you know, we have this core dilemma that comes up over and over, which is the innovation versus regulation and investor protection. And like I, I just saw a press release, Kraken announced that they were offering ApeCoin with margin training and 3x leverage, you know. And so, you know, how do you, how do you compete with that, Matt? Why don't you take that? Well, I think there's a there's a innovation for the sake of innovation, and then there's in some cases maybe irresponsible innovation, and I'm not that's not a commentary on that product to be clear. Uh, so we've certainly taken a more conservative approach, and in the U.S. we do have a regulator, and while we are uh, uh, an SRO, a self-regulating organization, uh, we still have to bring products to market that, that the CFTC will approve ultimately. And so when we think about innovation, we have to ask ourselves, what's the purpose of the innovation? What is the function of it? What is it actually adding in terms of value to the market? What's the utility of the product? So it's certainly there's room for innovation. Responsible innovation, I think, is the way that we would frame that thought process. Maybe, Rich, just to go to you, just to kind of set the table, if you will, you know, in terms of your daily activities, how much of that goes back to sort of regulated crypto derivatives? I'd say, yeah, it's hard to put a percent on it, but yeah. given that our business is much more focused on servicing the, the crypto natives, um, it's a rather small part. We're, okay. we're helping, um, today I think we have 250, uh, groups that create coins or tokens, so we're helping them bring the, the tokens to market, as well as uh, Light of the Board, and working with I think, 15 exchanges that there are our clients essentially contracting us to, to help make sure we're closing the, the, the gaps. And so uh, even though we, we are um, in regulated parts of the market, the, the bulk of the trading is um, offshore. Are we going to see an ape coin reference rate, uh, Tim? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, well, you know, just to bring up, you know, sort of one of the hot topics in, in your space, you know, FTX and their proposal uh, before the CMTC to clear margin swaps directly for consumers. I talked with Rich a little bit about this. I mean, the big, big question is you have these crypto firms and if they just come with new ideas, you know, that may actually fly, right? Or I guess I'm curious, you know, will that fly? Uh, if you have a comment on that, and, and I mean, in general, do you feel pressure from some of these new entrants? 
No, I mean, when we look at feeling pressure, no. Right, I think what we look at this is particularly in, in response to the proposal that is being publicly commented and debated on, is you know, we take issue with what is a lax regulatory proposal. Uh, we don't think it is good for the market. And when we look at it, it is dressed up as innovation, but is actually introducing significant systemic risk to the US institution that at the end of the movie, you may remove $170 billion of safeguards from the system. So just because it may be disruptive or it may be dressed up as innovation, that does not necessarily give it the credence to be fast-tracked or a regulatory light regime for the U.S. futures market. Uh, I want to come back to, to you, but either of you have any thoughts on this? Sure. What, all right, Rich, you go first. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's always good to, to challenge the norms. If uh, you know Glass Siegel was overruled, I think that the market has changed a whole lot in the last uh, you know even 10 years. So I think some of these rules that came into play 50 years ago, I think it's worth uh, addressing and at the right time in the right way. Um, I think that you can sometimes feel when something is a bit off, though, and some of the conflicts of interest are just. Um, very clear and in your face in crypto. So I, I do think that you know we have to have thoughtful um, people from TradFi you know, communicating readily with, with regulators as well as the younger entrepreneurs in crypto to get it right. Matt, what's your thoughts? I, I echo some of Tim's thoughts in regard to there really isn't anything necessarily innovative that's being proposed there. The, the auto liquidation functionality the kinds of things that they're talking about exist maybe in different pockets of the market. So the, the market structure is what they're proposing is a change to market structure, but I don't see any new technology innovation there. So the notion that technology has suddenly in the last couple of years enabled this to happen, it's, it's technology that's been around direct market access, late 90s, early 2000s, assisted liquidation or auto liquidation sometime before 2010. So you're talking about technology that's existed for 25 to you know, 10 to 25 years. So then it really becomes a question about, is this good for the market? Is it the right market structure? What are we gaining by that? And are we introducing new risks? The CFTC roundtable, there was quite a robust discussion. And there were some good points made on both sides. So we're not anti-innovation. We'd just like to see it discussed more thoroughly. It's a pretty fundamental change to market structure. Well, maybe just to circle back, as an open-ended question, what are areas where you felt where the CME was pushed to think, start thinking of things in a different way by crypto. I think it was the advent of Bitcoin futures in the US market. You know, when we go back in time to 2015, 2016, when we got into that space, there was an upwelling of interest and momentum amongst our customer base and amongst market participants. They, they wanted access to this market, but they wanted to do so in a regulated, tested and trusted manner, and that is what CME Group has a near two century history of doing. So we were compelled to listen to our customers, to listen to the market participants, to give the crowd what it wanted. So crypto, in essence, forced us to evolve in that way in terms of bringing this new product to market. But again, we start, CME started as a butter and eggs future exchange, and then we were the inventor of financial futures to begin with. This is just the latest and greatest chapter, again, in a 200-year history of innovation at CME. So did it force us to do the next product? Sure. But we've been innovating long before crypto came along. Rich, maybe a question for you. What, how do you, do, what do you think that the regulated futures industry should take from crypto? Butter and eggs are getting me, getting me hungry there. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd say that uh, most of the products that are being traversed from TradFi to, to crypto and all the innovation we've done, um, a, a series of different firsts, it's not that we invented it out of uh, thin air, but I do think that one that's coming from crypto to TradFi, I think would have a good impact, is perpetual futures. So tend to have more you know, commodity participants participating you know, in the commodity market. And you have to be an expert to use futures because either it, it rolls off and you're without a hedge, um, or you might be stuck some physical um, thing that's going to be coming to you. But a perpetual future, I think, is a better fit for a, a retail-driven market because there's, there's no expert. You could stay in the trade until you want to get out. Well, that's been one of the big complaints about the um, uh, Bitcoin futures ETFs, right? Is these roll costs? I mean, w would that go away if you if if somehow those ETFs were focused on a a, a perpetual? 
I don't think so. I mean, you know, from my perspective, it was interesting because there's a lot of Bitcoin purists out there, and we finally found the one thing they hate more than Bitcoin futures, and it's a Bitcoin futures-based ETF. <laughs> and so, like, these are, ex these are phenoms that exist in other asset classes, but it's the all-in cost of trading a Bitcoin in the future, as the name suggests, and there are certain costs that get priced into that. Now, a perpetual swap is only going to exacerbate any type of that phenom because there is no terminal node or expiration date of that contract, so therefore you have to price in a lot of that carry into perpetuity, especially inside an ETF wrapper. Um, so I think a lot of people you know, like to, to fan the flames of the spot versus futures-based ETF, but here's the deal. In the US, we have a futures-based ETF because we're a regulated underlying that enabled that innovation for the ETF market, and we're also supportive if, if, if and when a spot ETF comes online in the US because it's a highly symbiotic and interrelated market. But this whole kind of you know, hubbub around the contango and backwardation of futures, again, it's just exciting to see so many people in crypto talk about things that are, are long-standing phenoms that exist in the futures market. Um, let's just go to, to the next one here. Matt, you, um, uh, Aerosex, you're, one of your big things is a push towards the physical settlement, right? Um, versus the CME, it's a financial settlement. Can you tell us, like, what would that change? Why would that be important? Our clearinghouse can take crypto collateral into the clearinghouse, which is not universal. So this is a differentiator for us. And part of the longer-term value proposition that we saw with that you know, and Tim alluded to other markets. So I, I look at GLD uh, and the future, the COMEX futures contract as being uh, a good reference point. So GLD is a gold ETF. It's a trust that internal owns physical gold. There are market makers, authorized participants that can do the create and redeem of GLD and they use the futures product to hedge. So we see a future where, pun intended, where you may have a spot ETF, you need a futures product product to hedge that spot ETF. And the most efficient way to do that is have a futures product that can settle into the physical and to be able to do that in, in a clearinghouse. So this is, an, this is an area where we saw some part of the, the crypto markets that we needed to bring to futures, i.e. taking crypto into the clearinghouse, then also the ability to bring some of the benefits of traditional future markets to crypto to make those products more efficient. So we're hopeful to see a spot ETF and when we do, we're ready for it. Just you know, one of the things that's interesting is just the, the structures of the financial vehicles that are set up to, you know, allow people to speculate on crypto, but, you know, getting money from traditional big, you know, <laughs> real it's big institutional money that's, you know, not in crypto currently. And then just working within the regulations to try to make that work. You know, and then meanwhile, there's sort of DeFi that's just sort of inventing, reinventing itself every day. And I, I, I'm just, you know, how does that play out? Is, is, are some of these vehicles designed to allow people from traditional finance to speculate on crypto or hedge or whatever? Is that going away eventually? You know, is, are these temporary solutions or is this long term? What, what, what do you think, Tim? Well, I think when you look at what makes a market efficient at its core, it's diversity of participants and more important, diversity of opinions and belief about where is the next tick going to happen in this product. So you actually need all of it. You need the speculators. You need the hedgers. You need the liquidity providers. You need those that are holding open interest as an access product. You need those that don't hold open interest overnight because you need that fundamental disagreement to transfer risk between party A and party B and then tell the market this is the prevailing market price at this point in time. So it's all very helpful. And then I think when you then brought an outside of one center of liquidity to the ecosystem more broadly, the more gravity that these products and platforms have around a common price discovery or kind of a primary liquidity pool, you now increase the ability to move between or funge between the various liquidity pools regardless of the product wrapper, the product style, uh, the exact, if it's physical, financial, these are all things that are additive because people will have the ability to trade risk differently. And more importantly, we, that different in risk view or outlook is really what makes the markets trade. Otherwise, you just have markets staring at each other in the face and they're not going to move. What do you think, Rich? You know, there's certainly a, a timing element to it. If you think about 2017, you know, whether it was investing or, or speculating, it all felt extremely speculative. Um, it was very high beta. 
But I think you look at today, volatility has, has come off a lot. Our correlations have come down. There are differences between you know, NFTs and, and DeFi, uh, gaming, uh, esports. So some of these things shouldn't really be moving together. And I think that the idea that you're in a, a vehicle and they're, they're speculating when they should be investing, of course that shouldn't be happening. I think we should have it be that there's a, enough knowledge um, from both the investors and the, the, the fund managers to be able to demonstrate what they plan to do and stick with it. Matt, I mean, just, I don't know if, how you're gonna take this one, but, uh, you know, like DeFi, <laughs> it's okay, it's not that bad. Uh, DeFi, you know, there's all these protocols now. You can, you know, you can maybe replicate some of this stuff in crypto. Um, but I'm curious, is that anything that you ever worry about that just like, the, you know, things are gonna go that direction and this will just kind of be a relic? So I consider myself a student of market structure. I've been focused on market structure for more than 20 years now. and. One thing that's become clear to me is there are a whole bunch of different market structures that are applicable for different kinds of assets and serve different functions. So just because the central limit order book was invented didn't mean that telephone trading went away or pit trading. SIBO just relaunched its uh, an open outcry floor. So obviously that still has some utility. So there's a question as to when these products, the DeFi products, will they get to a point where they're of sufficient maturity and security that people that are managing other people's money, because this is a threshold question. It's one thing to take risk with your own money. It's another thing when you have a responsibility to somebody else. So retail traders, principal trading firms, they're trading their own money. Asset managers are trading somebody else's money. So if DeFi can get to a point where those asset managers feel it's secure enough that they can participate in it, then on a product by product basis, I think there may be some utility there, may compete with exchanges. Where people are borrowing and lending money, I think that's a, at least in the near term, a more likely place where you're gonna see DeFi shine. But in terms of whether it's a real threat in the long run, I think it might be complementary to the existing models. Do you have any thoughts on response to that? Yeah, I think um, you know, DeFi, I think, is extremely you know, inspirational. And even though all this is DeFi, I think trading Bitcoin futures on CME, it's not feeling as DeFi as using a MetaMask. Um, I could say that any sufficiently advanced technology should be you know, indistinguishable from magic. I think using, say, Instant Messenger 30 years ago or trading the, the first thing on, on screen uh, you know, 20 years ago and you know, a couple of years ago, first time using MetaMask, where you're in your browser and suddenly you, you send your, your crypto away and it's you know providing liquidity in the, the cloud. And I find it you know very impressive and I think that uh, so far it's more the, the tinfoil hats. I think there aren't that many more rooms this size of people that are really using MetaMask on a daily basis, but I think some of those same precepts can be applied um, to, to different types of liquidity provision and you know, have a big impact on traditional finance. Um. Just to give you one a, a question that you will like, I think. Uh, Do I, I mean, get one you, of those two? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Keep um, it spicy, right? Yeah. I mean, CME has clearly won the Bitcoin futures war for now. Uh, I mean, how much more growth do you see? I mean, is it is it going to where, where where does it go from here? I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I, my crystal ball is broken, right? But I think when we see the pent-up demand that we're seeing from the customer base is still, I think, a positive indicator for things to come uh, for the Bitcoin futures and Ether futures contracts at CME. And, and what I mean by that is, is think about, and I was talking about this earlier, uh, if we look at the cryptocurrency derivative space and even maybe crypto more broadly, it's kind of inverse where the individual driven market has developed first and now the wholesalers are trying to come in and figure out how to do a crypto version of what they do well. And CME's at the middle of that, providing access to those institutions who want that regulated underpinning to their products, the hedge vehicle, the price formation that happens in a futures curve, uh, augmented by the reference rate. So I think we're gonna see a lot more growth, kind of a second, third, fourth wave as the wholesaler and traditional institutions figure out how to do what they do well for those that want exposure to crypto. So I think that will continue to give us the uplift uh, for not only at CME, but I think derivatives more broadly, which I think is great for the industry. 
Uh, I think it's a growth versus growth story when we get into some of these product developments, whether it's ETF futures, cleared swaps, uh, sorry, uh, OTC swaps or other clearing uh, that may develop around it. Um, and I think it's still early days in the grand scheme of things, so I'm optimistic. Uh, but don't exactly know uh, where we'll be. I think a few years ago, we probably didn't think we'd be here uh, a few years uh, down the road, but it's been a great and exciting ride and certainly looking forward to what the next chapter holds. I think this will be our last question, but Rich, you had some interesting comments about um, the people impact here and, and how, you know, the, what has been the impact of crypto on a lot of sort of Wall Street or traditional finance employees bankers, traders, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we had a, a brief conversation on some different facets of how um, you know, Wall Street and the products are being impacted, but I felt a bit dissatisfied given how dramatic of a title this is, especially the, as we know it, it sounds particularly um, existential. Yeah. Um, it didn't seem like the topics we discussed was much more in the weeds were, were enough. And then after, um, afterwards, I thought, you know what? It's really the people elements that have had such an impact. I think when I look at my trading desk and uh, trading oil derivatives at Goldman, you know, most of that 12-person team is now in crypto. Half of them are at GSR. So I think when you look at Wall Street as opposed to Main Street and Wall Street, the people rather than the, the products or the exchanges or so, I do think it's had a, a huge impact, um, especially derivatives in the past year. And I mean, just... In other words, that idea of sort of voting with your career, like why are people making that choice? The obvious thing is, you know, the career FOMO, you think it would be about money. There's, there's obviously that. This is the, the money re reimagined um, auditorium. But I think when it comes to derivatives, there's the uh, love for complexity as well as, uh, you know, excitement seeking people. They like um, volatility. And I think that it's hard to point to another traditional asset class that has the same levels of complexity and excitement. Mm -hmm. Any, what are your thoughts on this? So I started my career when direct market access and electronic trading were really in their infancy in the, you know, in the early 2000s. And at that time, traditional folks would comment that it's a flash in the pan. Nobody's ever going to want to trade electronically. They, they, they'll always want to talk to the broker. They'll always want that trusted voice on the other end. And 10 years later, all the electronic people were the people running the entirety of Wall Street for the most part. <laughs> So I see another cycle like that happening here. It's a generational shift. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of new creativity, and you know, people that are late in their career that have made a lot of money, that continue to make a lot of money, don't necessarily have a motivation to change. I think the most creative ones, the most innovative, uh, and the most novelty-seeking people from Wall Street are the ones that are making the transition now, and they're bringing with them decades of accumulated knowledge and wisdom from those markets that they're now able to graft onto the crypto market. And I think that's pretty exciting. You know, I think the people that aren't going to make that transition will sit comfortably in their jobs until they retire. And those that actually really like this space and are excited about it are making the move now. All right, we have 28 seconds left, so I think we can probably end it a little bit early. But Matt, Rich, Tim, thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate thank it. You, thank you. Thank you.